it's always a great pleasure for me to talk about how it all started because um, I never get tired of telling the story and I never get quite over the fact that it's actually happened. Um, I think the most important thing in my life is that when I grew up, which is in the long ago past, and I was, and I'm talking the 50s, um, my family were very interested in food and this was very unusual. There was nobody that I knew who, the, whose parents had the same sort of attitude of sitting around a table at night. My father had had a very early introduction to wine in a very, you know, short trip to Europe when he was a very young man. And we had table wine on the table from the time I can always remember. And this was unheard of in 1950. <coughs> Six, I think, or fifty. No, it was more earlier than that, before the Olympic Games. Anyway, my mother loved food. She loved to cook, but she loved food probably as much, if not more, as an expression of culture. And she cultivated and made friends with anyone she could find that she felt came from a place that really loved good food and had something that could teach her or show her something new or different. And um, when I brought kids home from school for tea, they used to their eyes would pop and they would say to me, don't you ever have chops and peas? <laughs> and I would say, well, yeah, we do sometimes, but we don't only have chops and peas, we have lots of other things too. And those memories are very precious to me of that growing up when I was still at school. And I suppose it's, I've never ever lost the absolute conviction that the belief in um, the power of positive modelling and how important our early years are. And of course, that's really the, been the start of where we've started with the Kitchen Garden Foundation. Um, I know that not everybody had that background. I'm aware that it gave me a huge advantage. I'm very sad that my mother died before I really was able to say to her just how much that had given me. I mean, I'm still realising to this very day that having that sort of background where people sat around a table, my grandfather was always there, so it was a couple of generations where we talked and we laughed and we argued and the, t the food was always set out beautifully and it was simple food but it was fresh food most of it from the garden or some from the garden let's not exaggerate <laughs> it was an absolutely blissful way to grow up and um, it wasn't until i went to university and went into a tr women's college which was my first experience of institutional food a lot of my friends had gone to boarding school i went to local high school and I could not believe how appalling the food was that was being served to what was supposed to be young adults, 18, 19 years old. And we were given sliced white bread for lunch and I thought, oh, it's terrible. Anyway, I, I, I made lots of speeches about it, which probably drove everybody mad, but I knew what I had had and this was not it. This was not what, was, what ought to be happening. Then I went to live in France and taught in a teacher training college where the students were 18 and 19. They were training to be primary school teachers. And those kids every day had lunch. There was a chef in the kitchen. They had a little entree first, a little carrot salad, followed by a little something or other, a little braised pork chop, followed by a big bowl of green salad on the table, followed by little squares of camembert and a bowl of fruit. That was considered a normal lunch for an 18 year old student and the difference could not have been more stark and explains a great deal about where I've come from and what I think is important. Um, now what do we do Jess, we do this. Ah, so we, we're not going to go through all this except it's really the importance of that slide is to emphasise how long it's taken to get where we are now. In 2001, I went to the principal of Collingwood College and I said, I've got this idea, can we give it a go? In the meantime, I'd had 35 years running restaurants and I'd been very involved with young people, apprentices, people in front and back of house of restaurants. And I became very aware that although they were wonderful people and many of them still very dear friends of mine, many of them really had very little idea where food actually came from. And uh, so, and that started all the noise, the public noise in the newspapers, magazines, radio, etc. started talking about food choices and poor food choices. So it was a bit, it was really sort of a sense that this was very much in the, in the air, that people saw the need to change the way we were talking about food and in my opinion, the way we were teaching or not teaching our very young children about having a broad and active interest in every aspect of food. 
So anyway, we started with Collingwood. That was very successful. We then, I then started lobbying, which I think I'm still doing to this day. And it's been variously successful. We've had a lot of support from governments on the way, little bits of support. Then it stops, the government changes, and then it stops, and then we start lobbying again. And then we find that we have to make the program a bit more flexible, and Josephine can tell you a lot more about that. And by 2015, we had reached what we said was going to be our tipping point, in that we were going to be represented in 10% of all Australian schools. Well, I think we're now 11. 11% 11 of all Australian schools have got a Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden project of some sort. Some are much bigger than others, some are tiny and just starting out, others are really away and running and doing amazing things. 2017, we've actually embraced early learning and we've just started a pilot program into the secondary years, which we do not know how that's going to work, so it's very, very early days. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say was that the kids in this program learn the most amazing things. They, I mean, we're a not-for-profit charity. We believe our job is to support the schools and to do whatever we can to ensure the quality of the program that's being delivered in schools all around Australia. Clearly, we cannot visit all schools all around Australia, from the Pilbara um, to Kalgoorlie to, to has, you know, darkest parts of really, can we still got one on Australia, King Island? We've got one on Key Island, yeah. I mean, the, it's the most rem remarkable program for its breadth and reach. <coughs> and so we hear stories from all sorts of schools, very little schools, big schools. Um, well, the smallest school I've been, been to is one that had 20 students, but I know there are smaller schools. And there's another school in, in Victoria that has 1,400 schools. Now, you, you know, quite extraordinary to think that a particular program can be flexible enough to accommodate those um, two different extremes. And I just, I think for me, the most fascinating thing is going into the schools and just watching the kids and seeing what they learn and what they do. Um, and of course, I always taste their food and it's always beautiful. And we see them getting their knife license, getting their wheelbarrow license, understanding how to look after uh, aquaponics. I mean, amazing things are happening in the schools. They make beautiful bread. They, many of the schools have their own pizza ovens. They make pasta, they make soups, they make dips, they make flatbreads, they make curry, they make relishes, chutneys, have wonderful stalls at their school fairs. And most importantly for them, they eat together. And one of the most exciting and almost goosebumpy bits for me is seeing their faces light up when it's time to sit at the table. And it's not just because they're going to eat. It's the whole idea of gathering around a table, which sadly, for many of these children, is a rare experience. They do not do this regularly at home. And I personally think that's just a great tragedy. But at in the classroom situation, the eating together is just wonderful to see. They almost always have a little posy of herbs in the middle of the table. In some schools I've seen them, they're lighting candles, even if it's 10 past 10 in the morning. And um, the, the food is always put on the table as a platter, so that if they've made a pizza, it's not divided up, it's put there. If they've made risotto, it's in a bowl so they can see it. And this to me, anyone who in the room is who's a lovely cook knows that moment when you put the dishes out on the table and you look at it to realise just how beautiful it is before it gets dished up and squashed and sliced. And there is that moment and they, they just be. And uh, I can't, nobody can see this happening without being influenced by it and, and understanding the impact it's having on those kids. And then we hear from their parents the trickle-down effect is going home, talking to mum and dad, talking to grandparents, sometimes creating their own little small gardens. We don't, we don't want to make ridiculous claims because they're certainly not all going home and making a garden, but almost all children are going home and talking to their parents and making suggestions when the family goes shopping um, or saying when they are going shopping, we made that at school day, why don't we buy some fennel, Mum? And Mum says, what's fennel? And so kids can say, well, I can show you how to make a fennel salad or something. Anyway, a professional development is incredibly important. Um, these are the things that we think are really at the heart of the program. 
but it emphasises flavours and health, but we don't emphasise the word health. It's a very subtle difference. I emphasise the word pleasure. To me, nobody changes behaviour or modifies behaviour if the alternative that's being offered to them is something that is, uh, you know, finger wagging or full of negative negativity. I think you change behaviour when the the alternative is something you're finding really enjoyable and possible. So we we're concentrating on giving kids skills and understanding so they can do all these things and feel very proud and their self-esteem they just swell with excitement and pride. It's about fresh food of course it's about seasonal food and it's about growing and cooking it from scratch. We never we if they can, we don't go in for them making lots of stock because they haven't got time but they don't use them dishes that need stock so we make we just use what we've got and we use it as creatively and wonderfully as we can sweet dishes a bit of an issue and um, we say sometimes only you don't we don't say never but sometimes only is the go and particularly as many schools now have extensive orchards and those trees are often six and seven years old now and fruiting well so it would be tragic not to not to use that lovely fruit and the other thing that's very important in talking to um, bureaucracy and talk to the education department is that we can claim truthfully that it, this program integrates perfectly with the learning curriculum that of the, the, the other things that we want our children to understand at school. It's rich in literacy and numeracy, it's rich in mathematical concepts, it's rich in cultural understanding, it's rich in all the environmental sciences, investigating what's the life in the garden, it's wonderful for art and design, and they're just a few things. And of course it has unbelievable social benefits. Those children in those classes develop great responsibility, they, taught, they make decisions between each other, little groups, has this got enough seasoning in it, is this this is cut the right way, that sort of thing. Um, so teamwork and responsibility we just see all the time and the teachers comment on that. There's never any um, naughty behaviour, it's just concentration, pleasure, a nice animated buzz all the time in the classroom, but, but really wonderful. Now Josephine, I think you should now talk about this bit. We'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, I'm hoping. I'm trying to rush through. No, no, no rush. Plenty of time. So, um, excuse me. The way things work, as in what, what does that mean? What does that all mean in a kitchen garden school or a kitchen garden centre? How does it all come together? And that's what we call pleasurable food education. Pleasurable food education model is delivered through a kitchen garden program. It's, what, it's the difference between the software and the hardware, if that makes sense. So the hardware is a kitchen garden program and the kitchen garden program relies on these four pillars of growing, harvesting and preparing and sharing. And that's the four pillars that we encourage schools, schools and centres to take on so the kids grow their own food. Hopefully they've also helped design and plan and built the garden as well, so they're completely engaged with that. They know how to nurture, they're taught how to nurture those crops, they love their seedlings, they want to plant in the ground, they want to stop pests, but they want to stop pests organically so that they can eat the food that, that they've grown. It's in the school environment or it's in their education environment because they have to go there every day. So if they're not experiencing that at home, they're gonna get it at school. They learn how to harvest their crops really gently and in a protective and nurturing way. They take those crops into some kind of kitchen space in their school or centre. It doesn't have to be a purpose-built kitchen at all. It can be the staff room, the canteen, the out-of-school hours centre, the art room, any place there's a tap so that they can wash their produce and their hands and bench space for cooking. They can use electric fry pans. It's a really, really simple model. And through that, we help the educators in those schools and centres deliver the pleasurable food education philosophy. Does that make sense? Next slide. So what are those in ingredients? So we've mentioned professional development a couple of times. Teachers don't come out of teaching school with a kitchen garden program philosophy. They need professional development 
to understand what can be gained from a program like this and especially in how to integrate it with their curriculum. Teachers don't need extracurricular stuff, they need intracurricular stuff that they can use to teach the curriculum that they're mandated to teach. So we help them with that. We give them resources that show them how to teach literacy in the garden, how to teach numeracy in the kitchen, how to integrate it with their science and their arts and all of the subjects that Stephanie mentioned. It's a really important part of the program. And in early years, we're almost at the point where we've constructed the model for early years. We're making sure that it fits the early years development framework. We give them the resources to do that. We have a lot of print resources. We also have a large growing bank of online resources that, t that the educators can take, pick from, choose from. There's planning resources, recipes, there's case studies. There's a lot of different things that we give to educators to help them with this program. They access a lot of that through what we call our Kitchen Garden Classroom Membership. There's now over 5,000 educators in our online community community that we call the shared table and they all come there and they're posting all of these amazing activities that the schools and centres are doing every day. There's a post almost every half an hour in our community and they're downloading resources and they're interacting with each other, they're getting support from our staff and they're showing everyone what they're doing and it's an incredible dynamic environment. We can, if uh, able to, given the resources to, we will customise professional development for schools. So a lot of schools are coming to us now saying we want the whole staff integrated with this program. So we'll say, we can do it, can we break even, who can help with this? But if we can, we'll do it. Um, we also have our, what we call our support line, which is our staff in our office in Melbourne, on the phone and on their email every day, taking questions from educators across Australia saying, what chicken wire should I use? Or my parents don't understand why we're doing this, help me. Or we've got to find a grant to get a bulldozer in and level out this space, help us. And that's what we're here for too. So the model. Stephanie mentioned that we are flexible. So a long time ago, some of you in the room might have heard that you need a $60,000 kitchen and you need staff and you need huge grants to make this program happen, that's not the case. If you think that, please stop thinking that. We don't do that. We say, start small, use what you've got and we'll help you grow. And what they've got often is their community. So this has always been a community back when one of our schools, one of our first schools is Eagle Hawk, which you would have visited Stephanie. They had an amazing program, um, but it's adapted over time. And that's good because it suits them. And with that model, we would have suggested to them that they have a community meeting at the very start and bring in anyone who's interested in helping them with their program, tell them what they're trying to do and leverage some support. And the community comes <coughs> around that. And we'd love to see that and we can see that happening in the room now. So we have an adaptable model. We want the model, we want the program to work for the school community and for the centre community and for bigger communities of networks of kitchen garden schools and centres. So we work with the community to do this in a way that works for them. We also, as Stephanie mentioned, are working on a primary, primary an early years model and a secondary years model so that the educators in those sectors can get resources and professional development that works for them. So, the benefits. Huge benefits. So while this started off most certainly as a health prevention program and a health intervention based on getting kids to love and want to eat good food, there are so many benefits. As everyone knows here, you start talking about food and all of these other things happen. They see the kids, as Stephanie said again, the confidence and pride and the self-esteem that they get from, the, from doing this program is incredible. We walk into so many schools, that word calm, that's in big capital letters for a reason. There's so many kids who are not calm in their school environment because of what's happening outside of the school. But we can't, 
we come to schools and we see beautiful abundant <coughs> gardens of greenery and bean teepees and art and everyone working together and we go into the kitchen and the principal will say see that kid over there he's the most volatile kid in the whole school we can't control him and he's sitting there just chopping up a carrot frying it on the stove asking his friends what they would like to add and sitting quietly down to eat and they say that's the only time that child calms down and we calm down <laughs> when we walk into the school ground after all the hurly burly and the traffic and the radio and the world war three that's going on we walk into a kitchen garden school and everyone just calms down it's amazing so they learn life skills they start to learn about other work pathways that might they might not have opened up to them at the school they become engaged with learning i want to go to school because it's kitchen garden day today we hear that all the time <coughs> they link their real life contextual hands-on learning with their curriculum so that when they're sitting down in front of a whiteboard and being told this is what a fraction is they've already seen that when they've sliced up their pizza they know it it's changed their mindset already so it's not so difficult for them to absorb the classroom learning that they're forced to do they take the program home to families families are constantly coming to us and telling us about the impact of the program you've changed our lives they say my autistic child could, would never eat anything that was in front of him and because of what he's learned at school we can now sit down as a family and eat together we hear that and community building as i said the community comes around the school to help because it's such a great program everybody loves it everyone wants to be involved what can we do to help? Let's have a working bee. Bunnings. Bunnings is an amazing community resource. They want to help. Chook pens all over Australia are responsible, are the responsibility of Bunnings. Pathways, um, volunteer groups, councils, businesses wanting to donate dry goods, appliances, grants, they all come together around the school and are affected by what the school is doing. They start to embrace the philosophy. And the more schools that happen together in little environments, the more impact that has on the community. I'll probably mention also the amazing <clears throat> increase in enrolment. Mm -hmm. I mean, principal after principal tells us that their um, early years are increasing because the school has a kitchen garden program, which is great. Yeah, that's amazing. And we see the signage out there where a kitchen garden program school, and it's out there for a reason because people are drawn to it. We also see teachers using the program for lots of other practices, including mental health, including oral health, including trying to bring their cultures around their school together. Some amazing stories we hear about that. They're using it to teach agriculture where there is none. They're teaching kids where their food comes from. They're connecting them with local farmers, they're, which helps the farmers' mental health as well and they're using it for all of their environmental sustainability programs. It's huge, the amount of impact this program can have. So what do we actually do to help them? As I said, we provide the PD, the resources, the membership and the support from us as much as we possibly and physically can. We would like to do more, but I'll get into that. We want to help the schools build partnerships with each other and us and our partnerships with our special friends who invest in our work and help us help the schools. Uh, we want to empower school communities. School communities, by that I mean the people that are in the school, the staff and the students and their families and all the businesses and organisations that, that surround that school. We want to empower that community so that they can choose good food, make good food the norm, we're continually developing the program model to be more and more flexible and more and more adaptable to unique environments. We evaluate as much again as we possibly can with the resources available so that we're constantly learning from what all the school communities are doing and we're providing data to government to say that this kind of thing really works. Capture and share the knowledge. There's so many great things that the schools just do by themselves because they've got really creative and resourceful teachers and educators. So we want them as much as possible to tell us about all of these fantastic activities so that we can share them with the rest of the school community. It's a great way of sharing knowledge. And of course, 
we want to see something like pleasurable food education sitting inside the Australian curriculum, just like maths, just like English, just like music, just like care, just like all those other really important things. Food is one of those things. So, the cluster model. Tell me if you don't understand this. <laughs> when I'm talking about school communities, what we are trying to see is schools in local geographic areas, very much like the greater city of Bendigo, working together on their kitchen garden programs and changing the food landscape in those communities. Because it's a great place to change the food landscape from because schools have to be there. You don't have to ask permission from the government to have a school, it's there. Your kids have to go, all of the families are impacted for years over their lifetime. So it's a good base, it's a solid foundation to start something. But we, we see that them working together galvanises the community even more. So a school who's like Eagle Hawk, who's been running the program for 10 years, can help the school down the road with their program, because they've got a lot of experience and knowledge there. Having the learning centres now coming into the program, learn from the primary schools, exchange resources, share opportunities, buy in bulk, travel in bulk, learn from each other and be each other's buddy. That's the support network that we try to create now. And that's what we call the cluster model. Ultimately, if we had our way, we would have a project officer in a, every region helping those cluster models come together and make the most out of what they've got. We don't yet have the resources to do that, but we're working on it. So we want to change communities. We hear a lot about the obesogenic environment. That's what we want to change. We want healthy food to be the norm. We want delicious food to be the norm. And we want water to be the drink of choice. We want kids to be outside gardening with their families and with their community helping them. That's what we want to change. So we want to work with everybody here on how we can all do that together. We want to contribute to what is already happening here, which is really exciting and we can see the energy in the room, but how do we do that? How do we bring everyone together? It's a fantastic forum. Amy, so what are we, what are we gonna do from here to keep that happening? And how can we help? Because we're in Melbourne. How can we help you guys with what you're trying to do? That's what we'd like to know. Um, we have currently 11 schools and early years centres in the Greater Bendigo area. And that's out of a total of 98. So we'd always like to bring more into that cluster environment, okay? Always, we're here, we're ready, come to us, we can help you. We're specifically looking for a pilot centre in the Bendigo area for our early years program. So if you know of an early years centre who's really ready and right to go with something that looks like a kitchen garden program, please let us know. I've got some flyers for you. But we're still keen to work with the rest of the community on what we can do to help the schools and the kids. Um, any questions about any of this so far? Yes, please. Probably not a core question. You said that you connect kids with agriculture and that helps the um, farmers' mental health as well. Yeah. Would you be able to elaborate on what that looks like? It's not a fully fleshed out program yet, but we're working on this. What we see <laughs> is if we, we want to show kids where their food comes from, we want that to be part of their life and their world vision. So they might not become growers themselves when they grow up but they will know the effort and energy that goes into their food when they're purchasing it. So they understand the agricultural landscape and they'll understand what farmers face every day. What we're seeing is that a lot of schools on the back of this program will go, okay, we want to show them more. So they'll form relationships with local growers and farmers and take the kids out there to visit them. And those farmers who are just desperate for some community attention desperate for some support are just so gratified by the interest and engagement that those kids have with them because they're so excited. And then the farmer or the grower can come into the school and show the kids what they do within the school environment. And again, that's that sharing of knowledge and sharing of experience is a massive boost to them and it helps create those connections within that community. Does that make sense? That's so great. Yeah, that makes so much sense grow up who 
we don't really very fundamental people. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's absolutely it. And we see the arable land just disappearing as the sprawl continues outwards and the growers being under increased pressure all the time. But again, coming back to the school model, that school site has to be there. So it can become a site of urban agriculture and the growers can still contribute to that community that they're sort of being edged out of. And the kids still have that environment that they're coming to every day, not just being uh, exposed to McMansions and Mc. Well, can I say everything. that they also get exposed to, uh, because the educators in the schools uh, represent the community at la as, as diverse as it is, so in some schools you have an educator in a school who's got a special interest in her, and that special interest gets brought into the kitchen garden program. I mean, I visited a school in Queensland about a year ago and was invited into the kitchen class, and those kids are in grade four, were turning their camembert and needling their blue cheeses because the educator happened to be a cheesemaker. And so she was using her skills to enliven their kitchen their kitchen class and, that, and a few weeks ago I was in uh, South Australia and the kids in that school wanted me to come and have a look at their native beehive and it so that, and that that particular school had somebody who was very interested in rooftop honey and was in, also interested in native bees so that sort of freedom for the educator to give a personal you know, slant, not a slant, but it's just a speciality, happens all over the country. And that's what we see on the shared table when you look up what the, what the schools are posting. It's often really surprising what they're doing. Yes, please. So just practically for those 86 or 87 schools that aren't signed up there, um, what, what are the logistics of getting involved? Does it cost money? I presume it costs money and you know where how do schools generally go about sort of getting going and where do they get that initial money from or do they um, have you seen, you know, some examples from other places about how people get going yeah this is where we come back to our membership model so our business model and our charitable purpose allows us to support a school or centre once they become a member a membership costs $110 a year and $165 to join, and that's all. So that gives these people access to a, a shared table, which is our online community, we call it the shared table, and it gives access to support from our staff so they can ring us and talk to us any time they want. It also gives them huge discounts on professional development. We can't resource professional development for nothing. We'd love to talk to our government, um, but, uh, for instance, it'll give them about a $500 discount on the actual cost of training. So they can come to a professional development day. We hold them regionally when we can. So if there's enough interest in an area and we get about 20 or 30 educators coming, that's a break even for us. And we can give, run them through a whole day of professional development where they learn basic skills to transfer back to these kids. They have an amazing lunch together. They learn about curriculum integration, what they're going to plan, how they're going to plan out their program, and they make contact with each other, which is really crucial. They also get discounts on our resources, but the, once they get into the shared table, there's so many resources there. The others are extras, if that makes sense. So we can help with all of the planning. We just need them to contact us. So how much does a professional development day cost? $250. That's after the discount. After the discount. Which is nothing, you know, and uh, they are amazing days and teachers just reel away at the end of the day saying, I can't believe we've not only had such a fabulous day, but we've learned such a lot. They do. They say it's the best professional development they've ever had. And we got a lot of councils sponsoring schools to do this if they're really, really strapped. We get a lot of councils coming and saying, well, as part of our health and wellbeing plans, we will help that school get on board. And then we'll suggest to the school, OK, what have you got? What have you got in your school now? Have you got any piece of land? Or have you got some walls that get some sun sometime? Or a giant rooftop? We can work with that. 
get in touch with community helpers who can do that. There's always someone who's really good at gardening in the community. There's always someone on the, in the parent community who's a builder or a plumber or a, a labourer or an architect or all of these people can help transform the school into what the school wants to do. So if we, like, we were to get you know, a large number of schools together, could the professional development be held? In Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just give, give three examples of the most re regional development ones. Regional development one. So a, a couple of our staff members went down to Tassie, I think it was Launceston, and they were gobsmacked at the amount of enthusiasm that, that being there in that community helped to galvanise in the schools around them. So it is a bit of in-community helps really bring the spirit up. So they were able to get people around. Everyone came with their different kinds of honeys because everyone was growing bees at home. Growing bees, keeping <laughs> bees. <laughs> but a lot of them hadn't met each other before. So the, the training guys that went down there came back saying there's this whole community that's just come out of this. And they're sitting down to eat and it's like they're just having, it's, it's professional development by stealth almost because they don't know how much they're learning when they're just doing these things and, and interacting with each other and having a really joyful time together. And then they talk to each other afterwards and say, what are you doing at your site? What are you doing at your site? And I've heard there's a grant over here. Let's go for it. That's the kind of thing that, that we see happening. Is it ready to mix the professional development for early years, educators and teachers as yet? Because we've got quite a movement in our early years sector. At the, at the moment, it is already a mix. So we don't say no to early years. Early, we want early years to come to us. Eleven of those members that we have in Bendigo are early years. There's a huge early years movement. At the moment, it is mixed, but we're a bit concerned that because of our original primary school focus, we haven't got what we want to give the early years. So we're working on what professional development specific to early years looks like. So I'm working a lot with cooks Sorry. in no. early years. Um, yeah. I just wanted to highlight, like, Brian was actually one of the um, people that established the Eagle Hawk, Stephanie out of oh. Brian Hospin here. So we've got I great, thought I recognised um, your face, yeah. Well, so, yeah. Tell Brian, Eagle, Eagle Hawk <laughs> is amazing. It's an amazing school. I'm so sorry, I've seen your name a million times. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't been there for a few years now. Yeah. 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 It's, it's really good to be involved in and I mean, it doesn't just change the kids. They are cool. it, it, like you say, it changes the community. You know, probably with it for Eagle Hawk, it's changed <coughs> Bendigo's uh, view of, of, of school gardens and community gardens and, and the whole group. So it's in, in Wasn't it Mary Ann Rooney? Mary Ann Rooney. And then she went to Winter's Flat? Yes. Did the same yeah, thing there. Yeah, yeah. So a really, you know, a principal that really believes in the program often takes it with him or her as they move to another school, which is, of course, fabulous. I saw her the other day. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Have you got an example of a, a government high school that has adopted the program and are having great success? <laughs> We're just starting like, out with primary school. I've got a lot of yeah. uh, my kids now out of high school. Yeah. And the primary schools, they're so engaged and it's, yeah. there's lots of primary schools in regional Victoria that are involved in the program. Yeah. But now my kids are at high school that's, oh. and there's a community garden within the high school, but there's not a lot of activity and it's, yeah. it's really frustrating to be great to hear about It's a real shame, isn't working. it? Yeah. So we've, we've had these questions which um, assisted us to seek funding from a corporate and we now have funding to start a kitchen garden program for secondary years. We don't know what that looks like yet. Um, secondary environments very different from primary. <laughs> uh, so we are probably around oh, eight months, ten months into that project where we're just we're working with three pilot schools, Narra Warren South, uh, one Western in Heights. Western Heights in Geelong and Namurka up in, near Shepparton. And well, they're a really engaged team of staff and students. And again, we don't know what that program model will look like. But we do know that at um, Narra Warren, the um, VCAL students yeah. had already built the pizza oven and uh, had made these marvellous um, galvanised pipe 
gardens, I suppose you'd call them gardens, yeah. on the wall where they'd cut them out and they had all these beautiful strawberries growing down, hanging down the wall. I loved that. Yeah. Very clever with the irrigation pipe running through. Yeah. Yeah. So they were lovely. A lot of high schools are saying this will fit perfectly into our BPAL stream. These kids are at risk of just disengaging altogether. We give them something really tangible to do Absolutely. and give them something to feel really proud about, which is what exactly what we saw at Narrow Warren. It was amazing. We said we're going to have this launch here, and the whole the whole VCAL stream worked like treaters for three weeks and just built this garden out of nothing and then turned around and went oh my god look what we did just based on a bit of bit of momentum so we are working with secondary but we would want to make sure that the model we give out is something that will work for the schools can i just add to that with the with the garden scheme that was i worked on the garden scheme that was uh, created at Collingwood college with, at the island which was an alternate setting and just part of that with the engagement with like pre was uh, kids at risk, particular age group between nine and year nine and ten, and the positive behaviour change that came with that with students actually cooking, uh, feeding it into the VCAL program, um, horticulture and hospitality working together and sitting down and the students having lunch was just and you could just see as a teacher you could see the change in the student. Um, and it just it took on, it also took students into TAFE and it took students into further education yeah. after that and re-engaged them because they were actually learning the numeracy and literacy in something that they became interested in. So just, just feedback from what That's fantastic. That's exactly what we all want, I think. Mm. That's great. I do have to acknowledge just just before we wrap up that we have a very special partner Medibank um, there's potentially a Medibank retail store in this area they want to help it's one of the partnerships we we have and we want to leverage their staff are really engaged and want to help so we can talk about that too uh, the last slide is this is how you get in touch with us. It's really, really simple. Or you just come to me and get a card, or, or I'll take yours either way. But if you want to learn more, it's all available on our website. And there are people dedicated in our office to answering your questions. All, all anyone has to do is get in touch and we can go from there. And, and in my final word is that we have the most extraordinarily dedicated staff. I mean, Josephine's doing a marvellous job as a new CEO. And how many... Ha how many people do we have? 24 now. You know, from from starting with uh, my personal assistant in my spare bedroom in 2001 <laughs> and uh, <coughs> lobbying, lobbying, lobbying endlessly to a situation where we really are a very hard-working and very professional organisation. Mm -hmm. And I think we've gained enormous awareness. I've just finished a book tour, which has taken me all over Australia. And whenever I was talking to people, supposedly about my new book, which I haven't even given a rap to, but anyway, <laughs> um, everybody in the room knew about the Kitchen Garden Foundation. So whatever we haven't done, we have spread the word and that people can talk about it and think about it. A lot of those people were probably no longer parents of little kids in the primary years, but they have grandchildren or they know other people and so on. And I was really knocked out about the overall awareness of the work that's being done. So they really are an amazing team.